always start out the meditation with thoughts of goodwill. And thoughts of goodwill have to start right here with yourself. Just tell yourself, may I be happy, may I find true happiness. That helps set the tone for the meditation and remind you why you're doing it. Because most of the happiness in the world is not all that true. There are pleasures in the world. Buddhism never denies that. But the question is, how long do they last? And when they go, what did they leave behind? It's not the case that every pleasurable experience is going to become a pleasurable memory. Sometimes when you've lost something, your, your remembrance of your memory of the, the pleasures you had becomes a painful thing. So you want to try to find the kind of happiness that doesn't let you down, that doesn't turn into pain. And that has to be found inside. And it's a difficult process. And many times when as we, as we encounter the difficulties, it seems that we're putting ourselves through needless suffering. But what is the suffering? It's just the, the pains in our own bodies. The difficulty that comes when we go against old habits that we've developed in the mind. But keep reminding yourself, okay, there's a purpose behind this. purpose is to find true happiness, not let ourselves get distracted by other kinds of happiness that are going to come along and pull us away. And if you're going to understand true happiness, you do have to understand true suffering. What does it mean when we suffer? That's an unavoidable part of the meditation, but Buddhism, the Buddhist teachings don't throw you right into the suffering. And they do it, don't do it in a grim way. I remember when John Sawat was teaching a retreat in Massachusetts. After two or three days of watching the meditators, he said, people here are awfully grim when they meditate. There's no sense of joy. There's no sense of confidence in what they're doing. And his explanation was that they come to, they come to the Dharma straight at meditation without having built up their confidence, without having built their experience. Yes, the Dharma does lead to happiness. You observe the precepts, even though there are, they place restrictions on what you can do and what you say, you begin to realize that they're wise restrictions. And as you have a sense of boundaries in what you do and say, you find yourself, that you don't create unnecessary suffering for yourself. Think about what happens when you break the precepts, say, against lying. All of a sudden you have to cover up for the lie, you have to worry, will the person believe me? You have to make up a story. And then if you do get caught out, okay, then your reputation suffers. And even if you don't get caught out, there's a sense of dis-ease around that whole incident. Whereas if you make your mind, you're up your mind, you're only going to tell the truth. To tell the truth that is appropriate for each occasion. It's a lot easier. Create a lot less suffering for yourself. Life becomes a much lighter thing, because you don't have these things hanging in your background, you, knowing that you've done wrong, knowing that you could get caught at any time. There's nothing to catch, nothing to get caught. Same with the practice of generosity. It gives you a sense of well-being. You realize that you don't have to be a slave to your greed, you don't have to be a slave to your possessiveness. And it gives a sense of spaciousness, lightness to the mind. Life is a lot easier when you say, well, I can do without that. And I can give it to somebody else who needs it. Then if you say, I need this, I need that, got to hold on to this, hold on to that, and the things that you're holding on to just disintegrate right in your grasp. Whereas when you let go, okay, there's nothing to hold on to. No need to hold on. There is that sense of lightness that comes as you realize you can do without this, you can do without that. Life becomes a lot lighter. So when you come to the meditation with that kind of background, there is a sense of confidence, there is a sense of well-being. 
Because if you're going to tackle the problem of suffering, you do have to have that basic sense of well-being, that basic sense of goodwill for yourself. And it's not just a sort of a vagrant thought or wishful thought. You've seen that you've, as you show goodwill for yourself in what you do, what you say. In other words, you're not going to do things that are going to cause you suffering later on. You really are concerned for your own happiness, and you really do act in line with that concern. There comes a sense of self-respect, self-esteem, and then a sense of well-being. Then as we practice meditation, we try to build on that sense of well-being. Focus on the breath in a way that's comfortable. Make the breath your friend. So oftentimes when we meditate, we get into this sense that the object of meditation is an opponent, something we've got to wrestle down. It's a real fight to stay with it, and it may not be all that pleasant to stay. If that's your attitude, you can't stay very long. But if you stay with a breath that's comfortable, allow the mind to sort of settle into the breath and stay there. Experiment to see what kind of breathing feels good right now. As you allow yourself to feel good in the present this way, it becomes a sense of stability, an even deeper, more pervasive sense of well-being. You're creating a foundation. Once you have that foundation, that inner sense of well-being, okay, then you can look at the issue of suffering and stress straight on, because you don't feel quite so threatened by it. If you look at suffering and stress with the idea, I want to make it go away right away, it just adds more suffering on top. But if you can get the kind of detachment that comes, it's okay, you have a place where you can go, the sense of well-being with a breath. When things get bad, okay, you've got a place to rest, a place to recuperate. So you're not totally at the mercy of the vagaries of the world. Then you can look at, say, the pains that come up in the body and say, okay, exactly what is it about this sensation that makes such a weight on the mind? And instead of telling yourself, well, of course it's going to make a weight on the mind, the Buddha says it doesn't have to. So we've got to check out, how, what does he mean when he says that? How can it be that there can be pain in the body, but the mind is totally unaffected by it? Not that it doesn't sense the pain, not that it doesn't realize it, but it's, it can be with the pain and not, get, not feel threatened by it. How does that happen? This is a sign that the reason we do suffer from the pain is totally unnecessary. There's something we do. The way the mind relates to the pain, that's what causes the problem. Not the pain in and of itself, it's our way of relating to it. This is good news because it means that the, the whole question of suffering lies under our power. We can train ourselves not to relate to pain in a way that brings suffering into the mind. And you can look at it. How do you relate to the feeling? Well, there's a metal label and there's a preconceived notions about the pain, and there's the, all the stories you fabricate around the pain. Those are the problems. So you want to have the steadiness of gaze and the ability not to get sucked in by your thoughts, to start taking them apart. And the fact that you have this foundation with the breath, okay, that, that gives you the place where you can take a stance, so you don't get sucked in by the content of your thoughts, and just look at the thoughts as processes. When you can pull yourself out just that much, then you're able to let go of them a lot more easily. See that they are unnecessary. The same principle works in a more subtle way, even when you're sitting and meditating and there are no pains at all. Everything seems to be going on really smoothly, easily. Well, you try to maintain that sense of ease. Try to make it as steady as possible, and all of a sudden you begin to realize, well, it wasn't quite as easy as you thought. There's a certain amount of stress in there, a certain amount of change. Well, look into it. Try to be more and more sensitive to this level of stress. The Buddha said there are three kinds of stress. One is the stress of pain. 
But there's also the stress of change, and there's the stress of fabrication, this the mind's tendency to keep creating things, creating things. So we know that there may not be any obvious pains or discomfort in the meditation. Still, there's this process of creating, fabricating. There's the element of change in there. Look into that. Make yourself sensitive to that. Because the more still the mind is, the more it can see these subtle things. And you begin to realize that here, too, that the reason these things weigh on the mind is as the way the mind relates to them. There's something it does. Let's look into what it's doing. Because most of us, when we meditate, we're like a little child learning to walk. The child doesn't move only the necessary muscles to, to walk, but gets a lot of other muscles in the body involved as well. Arms, swaying here, swaying there. And so after a while, it begins to realize, hey, those, those movements are not necessary. It's a lot easier to walk if you trim down and make your walking more efficient. Well, it's the same with the meditation, as we get the mind to settle down. As the Buddha said, in the first stages of concentration, all kinds of activities are going on in the mind. You keep directing your thought to the object, you keep evaluating it, you keep making the effort to make it one. You have to deal with feelings of pleasure, feelings of rapture, which are nice, but you don't want to get carried away by them. So you have to keep your focus right on the breath, and not let yourself get carried away by the pleasure. But as the mind gets more and more stable, you can begin to realize you don't have to keep evaluating what you're doing. You don't have to keep reminding yourself to stay with the object. You just plant it in it firmly. Then you can let go of those activities, and the mind goes to a deeper level of stillness as it throws its baggage away. The story they tell of a John Lee taking a group of his students, both monks and lay people, out on a trip into the forest. They were going to get on the train in Bangkok, a ride up to Lopurdi, and from there go into the forest. Well, they all arrived at Bangkok, and for many of these people, this was their very first time out in the forest, and a lot of them brought a lot of luggage along. And John Lee saw this, and instead of getting on the train, he just walked down the, the train tracks. And since he was walking, everybody else had to walk, too. And as they were walking along, the people who had the most luggage started complaining. Why are you making us walk? This is what, Can't you see what heavy luggage we have? First he didn't say anything. Finally he turned to them and said, well, if it's heavy, then let go of it. And so they realized they had no choice but to stop, open up their luggage, take out only what was really necessary, and just throw out the, everything else into the lotus ponds on the side of the railroad track. When they got to the next station, he saw that everybody's load was pared down to size, so they were able to get on the train. That's the way most of us go through life, carrying all these heavy burdens, and then complaining. Because we have so many other things to do as well, in addition to carrying the burdens. And it's learning how to let go of those burdens. That, that's what makes life a lot easier. It's the same with your meditation. You find that there are a lot of burdens you carry into the meditation. A lot of preconceived notions, a lot of clingings and attachments. And as you get more and more skilled at the meditation, you find you let them go, let them go, let them go. And as you let them go, everything gets lighter. It's the same principle as generosity. The more things you can do without, the lighter life becomes. The fewer things you have to cling and hold on to, the more goodwill you're showing for yourself. This goes against the way of the world, which says the more things you can amass, the happier you'll be. But that just creates more attachments, more things you have to be responsible for, more things you have to worry about. Whereas you can train the mind to be strong so it doesn't need to depend on those things. Okay, and then you're really in good shape. You're really looking after your own true happiness. So the practice is basically a way of showing goodwill for yourself. This is why we begin with goodwill every session. Because the same basic principle carries us all the way from the beginning of the practice all the way on to the end.
the less baggage you carry, the happier you'll be.